Heavenly Father, once again we come before you because we acknowledge our great need. So please enlighten our minds and help us to understand not only what you want to tell us in terms of the plan of salvation, but help us also to understand all the turmoil and the battle and the intrigues that happen around the Word of God when we do want to know what the truth is. Bless us now, in Jesus' name, amen. The study of God's Word ennobles the character. And it is through the Word that we become transformed, because through the Word we behold the author of this word. And by reading the word, our thoughts and our feelings are altered. We start thinking in other channels, we start feeling other feelings, and thoughts and feelings combined make up the character. Now, thoughts and feelings combined will also lead to altered actions. So eventually, by studying the Word of God, by changing the channels of your thoughts, by feeling other thoughts, your actions will also change. And this is how the Holy Spirit works in us. Now, the Bible is full of the stories of how this great apostasy in the world started and how this great conflict between good and evil in which we unfortunately are trapped, how it came into being. And there are beautiful and sad typological stories in the Bible which make it clear as to what the conflict is and how it will play out in personal lives. The story of David and Saul, for example, is a typology of the great battle raging between Christ and Satan. And this battle will rage until the close of probation. Now Saul was given ample opportunity to make right decisions. And he could have subjected himself to the word. And he could have changed his thoughts and his feelings. But there was too much self interwoven in his activity. So this typology of the battle between Saul and David shows the conflict between Christ and Satan. And we know that David was first banished. And so we also, by our natural inclinations, banish Christ out of our feelings, out of our makeup. But the more we study the word, the more we are inclined to want to be on that side. And the same happened with David. More and more and more the people defected from Saul and aligned themselves with David. So this is the battle. And it is a counter battle all the time. But not only two adversaries that are not related serve as this typology, it gets much closer. It actually gets into your family. And so there are other typologies which depict the battle between good and evil which come much closer than someone who is just out there, like Saul, who was not related to David. So this battle eventually moves right into the heart of David's family. And that is the way in which God can reach out to us most effectively. Because, you know, if someone else out there badmouths me, big deal. Bye. <laughs> Do your thing, pal, and off you go. You could have that attitude. You don't know the person. He might irritate you for a day or she or whatever. And then you get over it. But what if it's your own family? What is it if it's your best friend? What is it if it's your immediate circle? It's not so easy then just to write it off. 
Something has to give. Something has to give. Either you become aggressive and uh, the world falls apart, or you change. So this typology intensifies as we move closer into the family circle of David. And David is a human being. He serves as a type of Jesus Christ, but he has tendencies. And uh, one of his tendencies is that he had an eye for the ladies. Which epigene he passed on to his son Solomon in some great degree, the poor man. So we struggle with these inherited tendencies and infirmities. And David, at some point, commits this grievous sin, which totally shatters his world. And he tries to cover it up, even with a murder. That's how far you will go. Even God's people can get into a fix like this. And I'm so grateful for the Bible that doesn't mince its words. And eventually, God sends the prophet Nathan to David after his affair with Bathsheba. And he fixes his eye upon the king. And lifting his right hand to heaven, he solemnly declared, Thou art the man. After telling him a parable of this rich man who comes and takes this poor man's one and only little lamb, kills it and dresses it and gives it to his friends. And David is so indignant. And he says, penalty, four times as much he has to pay back. Then he hears these terrible words, thou art the man. Hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? The guilty may attempt, as David had done, to conceal their crime. And they may seek to bury the evil deed forever from human sight or knowledge. But nothing is naked to the eye of God. He sees all things. And David is cut to the heart. And he's repentant. And he has sorrow, not like Saul had, for the loss that he experienced, but for the deed that he had committed. He had genuine repentance. That was the difference between David and Saul. And because his repentance was genuine, God forgave him. But he was never the same. He became a much weaker king because he realized his own weakness. And so he had a tendency to overlook transgression in others because he felt his transgression was so great and he was forgiven so much. Why should he not also be lenient to the others? And that in itself can bring in a whole can of worms. So David was forgiven and David was reconverted. And Psalms 32 is the psalm that he wrote after this experience. And he starts off with this word, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And then he recounts, his feelings when he, hid, when he had hidden his sin, even under the cloak of murder. And he said, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into drought of summer. It's beautiful poetic language describing the drying up of his system and his conscience that was destroying him. And then these words, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Isn't that a beautiful resolution to the problem? 
For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayst be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And he's quoting the promises of God. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a bit and a bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall encompass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. So this shows a true repentance. It is, it is a very beautiful psalm. So this enemy inside of us, this fallen nature, is our greatest enemy. But the way in which we realize how bad it is, is when we come into these conflicts. And the conflicts are supposed to teach us something. And we can also learn the ways of the devil to destroy us, how he works. Because the conflict can lead to a choice between two Bs. You can become better or you can become better. And that choice is yours. So the fight is not against the physical enemy. It's against the organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen powers that control this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. We are constantly surrounded by this external attack. It's not something you can avoid. It's how you deal with it that will eventually determine the outcome. And we all have this problem. The Bible has very little to say in terms of the praise of men. Because it is a perilous thing to praise or exalt man. It is a very dangerous thing. One should never go to a preacher and say, Poof, that was great. Because you could just get puffed up. But that's just one problem. The other problem is that should he become puffed up, it will be necessary for God to give him a bonks on his bean. And that is often a very, very painful experience. Not that I, of course, have ever experienced it, but it's a dangerous thing. We need to know who we are, and we need to know what our dependence is. Now, the story of David really unfolds in, a, in an amazing way because it explains to us the battle lines and God's intervention as to how it works. He said he will pay four times, and of course we all know that David paid four times. His firstborn that came from Bathsheba died. And he was in sackcloth and ashes and he wouldn't eat. And his servants said, you have to eat. You have to get your strength together again. But he wouldn't. He knew what the problem was. He knew that he had condemned himself. And he was going to bear the consequences. And when that child died, he washed himself, dressed himself. And they said, what's the matter with you? Now he's dead and now you're okay. He says, well, while he was still alive, there was hope. But now I will accept my, my punishment. And then Amnon, his first was, firstborn, was murdered by Absalom. And then Absalom died. And then his brother Adoniah died. So he paid four times. And this, this, this story is so amazing. Because David had this great guilt upon him. He wasn't able to rebuke wrongdoing in his children because he was constantly looking at himself and realizing what he had done. And so he really became quite weak in that area. 
Now, you know the story of what happened. Amnon was the while, the one who defiled his half-sister Tamar. And uh, Absalom, who was the brother of Tamar, was furious. And he devised the plan to take revenge. And it came to pass after two full years, we read in 2 Samuel 13, verse 23, so Absalom waited two years after that defilement of his sister, that Absalom had sheep bearers in Baal Hasor, which is beside Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. So he's the one who's ordering the execution of his half-brother. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat up him up upon his mule and fled. Now we discussed yesterday, I think it was, that king's sons rode on mules. So they all dispersed on their mules. And then we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, like other sons of David... Amnon had been left to selfish indulgence. He had sought to gratify every thought of his heart, regardless of the requirements of God. Notwithstanding his great sin, God had borne long with him. Two years. He had an opportunity to repent. For two years he had been granted opportunity for repentance, but he continued in sin. And with his guilt upon him, he was cut down by death to await the awful tribunal of judgment. A lost son. Not just lost to this earthly world, but lost for all eternity. I mean, that's an incredible judgment. So there's a lamb gone. So David banished Absalom, his son. He didn't destroy him didn't execute him for this deed. He banished him. And because he was the the son of a heathen woman, he could go to that heathen nation and find a place where he could live in the time of his banishment. And David wept for Absalom. He mourned for Absalom, but He was determined Absalom was not to return. And then at the instigation of Joab, this is another interesting story, Joab, the general of the armies of Israel, he devised the plan to get David to bring Absalom back. And it's a long story, we're not going to go into it, but he was very clever and he got another lady to go and tell a story which is similar and then basically you are the man. Why are you leaving this son that you are longing for so much? Why are you leaving him banished? And we carry on with the story in 2 Samuel 14, 24. And the king said, let him turn to his own house, so he may come back, and let him not see my face. So he can come back to Israel, but I'm not going to see him. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. And then we have the story of Absalom. And the typology there is amazing. By the way, the title of the sermon is Crown of Glory. We'll see why in a moment. Verse 25, 2 Samuel chapter 14. But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Now that's a typology, and uh, it describes one of great beauty, beautiful stature, someone who was immaculate. We read about him in Ezekiel and Isaiah, that is Lucifer, who from the day that he was created was perfect and he had hair that was just amazing 
There was no blemish in him. Verse 26. And when he polled his head, that's cut his hair, for it was every year's end that he polled it, that he cut it, because the hair was heavy on him. Therefore he polled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. So when he cut his hair, one year's growth, it weighed 200 shekels. Now, the shekels value varied from king to king because the king determined what the weight was, what the value was. So in different times in Israel, it could be, one shekel could be the equivalent of 11 grams or 14 grams in another season, or the maximum it ever was was about 17 grams. So if we take 11 grams per shekel, then his hair, after one year's growth, would have weighed 2.2 kilograms. At 14 grams, it would have been 2.8 kilograms, and at 17, it would have been 3.4 kilograms of hair, one year's growth. Mine would be 3.4 milligrams. <laughs> this guy had hair. <laughs> Unbelievable. It was like a crown of glory upon his head. And he only cut it once a year. And if it weighed up to 3.4 kilograms, I mean, that's massive. Can you imagine that? I mean, he must have been like a lion walking around and strutting around with his hair. He had a crown of glory on his head, which unfortunately went to his head. Now the Bible warns about uh, things like that, you know. The Bible tells us uh, that we sh the women shouldn't have these braided hairs and all of them. The woman's hair is her covering. It is her crown of glory. And yes, it is true. You know, some women, if they have very beautiful hair, have you watched them? <laughs> it's just part of human nature. So the hair can give you something. If you think of the story of Samson, Samson had hair probably even better than Absalom's hair. And uh, the hair was his strength. And when he relied on his strength, then he lost his virtue. But when that day came, when he stood there between the two pillars, and his hair had grown back, and he realized that the hair was just a symbol of a higher nobility, a nobility that comes from God, and he prayed humbly, that God would give him strength just one more time to push those two pillars apart. Then God gave him the strength because even the beauty that we have is a gift from God. But selfish nature takes that beauty and makes it your own and then boasts with the beauty that you have. No, with great beauty should come great humility because the beauty is a gift from God. And Samson, when he stood between those two pillars, and of course the two pillars stand for the two pillars of society, church and state. And church and state was all gathered in that banquet hall. And when he pushed the two pillars of church and state apart, as will soon happen in this world as well, the whole economy was destroyed and all the princes of the Philistine died. So here was this man with this crown of glory that went to his head. And the same happened to Lucifer. It was because of his beauty that his soul became corrupted. And uh, he thought he was better than others. So people that start thinking that they are something because of whatever they have that they think is great, become a serious problem. Second Samuel 15, verse 1, and it came to pass after that, that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses. He progressed from mules to horses. And 50 men to run before him. 
And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. Now, this is how it works. And we must understand how the devil works. Because this is going to happen to us more than once. He's not lazy. He works. And he gets up early. And he goes and stands beside the gate. He wants to be seen as one in authority, one who can pass judgment. But his judgment is based on a selfish motive, not a motive to satisfy righteousness and justice, but a motive to gratify himself and further his own agenda. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment... Then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel, whatever it was. So in actual fact, someone is coming to ask advice of A, and someone intercepts that person and says, No, 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 don't go there. I'll give you that advice. And he'll do it with flattery. Where are you from, my friend? Come and tell me. And he's very diligent. He's very hardworking at it. He's very good at it. And Latimer, one of the martyrs of Oxford, also said the same thing. He said, the most diligent bishop in the entire British realm is the devil. He's always in his archdiocese. He's always working. He's up early in the morning. There's no laxity with him whatsoever. And then Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right. That's a way of flattering people that is unbelievable. Your matter is good and right. Excuse me, have you heard the other side of the story? We must be very careful to make judgments based on one side of a story. But there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. They won't be able to help you. I'm here. I'll help you. What can I do for you? Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which has any suit or cause may come unto me. And I would give him justice. So this is how the devil works. He isolates people and he herds them into his camp. Beware of herders that herd people into camps that go and whisper in the corner. You won't get justice there. Come and listen to me. I'll give you justice. And eventually he wins the hearts of the people because he flatters them. Flattery is one of the most dangerous tools of the devil. And we have to be aware of it and we have to shun it in every single possible way. Immediately red flags must rise. Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which has any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so, that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeyance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. <laughs> this guy's a pain in the neck. And in this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. This is how it works. And we have to beware of this tactic of the devil to go and take people to himself and keep him away from others. 2 Samuel 15 verse 12 says, And Absalom sent for Atiphophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor. Now it gets a little bit more intriguing. From his city, even from Gilo, 
while he offered sacrifices in a religious setting. And the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. So he, he shepherds one of the counselors of David, one that is from his territory, a family member. Let's get the family members on my side. And let's do it in a religious context. After all, we are such good Christians. This is very scary the way he worked. And the conspiracy was very strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. Psalms 3 verse 3, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. This is the psalm that David wrote while he was being banished because of this conspiracy which was gaining ground. Psalms 3, 1 to 8 is about David fleeing from Absalom because the people eventually turned against him. Mercy and kindness actually favor rebellion. Have you thought of that? Mercy and kindness favor rebellion. David was being merciful to Absalom. David was being kind. Absalom get a, gets away with whatever he does. And if you are seen to be merciful and kind, well, then the Absaloms of this world will take another step and another step and another step. And before you know it, you have a rebellious house. And that's what happened in heaven. He would say to the angels, God doesn't have time for your problem. Come to me. God is the great judge of the universe, but he's, he's busy. Come, come to me. And he would insinuate and insinuate and eventually you'd have all these alliances. Now why would God permit something like that to happen? While the king was more and more inclined to desire retirement and solitude, Absalom seducedly courted the popular favor. Day by day, this man of noble appearance might be seen at the gate of the city where a crowd of suppliants waited to present their wrongs for redress. Absalom mingled with them and listened to their grievances, expressing sympathy with their sufferings and regret at the inefficiency of the government. We read that in the Spirit of Prophecy. So these people will go to the two individuals and say, I don't think that you're getting a fair deal here. Let me help you. And so he would herd off and create camps within camps. And eventually you have an entire rebellion that ended up in a war in heaven and as verily ends up in a war down here. Beware if people act in this fashion. By his remarkable beauty, winning manners, pretended kindness, I'll give you justice. You're not getting a fair deal. I'm wondering why your overseer has so little time for you. If only I were in charge, it would be different. This is what he was doing. He cunningly stole the hearts of the people. He did not possess benevolence at heart, but he was ambitious and his course shows would resort to intrigue and crime to obtain the kingdom. He would have returned his father's love and kindness by taking his life. He got to the point where he was willing to kill David. And it can as verily happen to any one of us, a family member, a friend, someone in the church, it could happen. We must be so alert and so awake. 
His course shows that he would go to intrigue and crime to get the kingdom. And he was going to return the kindness that David had shown him by taking his life. That's how far you can fall. So David is driven from Jerusalem. If we practice the ways of Absalom, just as surely as David was driven from Jerusalem, Jesus will be driven from the heart. And that's a very dangerous situation. We must learn from these practices. Many who see not as God sees, but views mat view matters from man's standpoint, might reason that with David there might have been an excuse. Because David had, you know, sinned and he was being lenient and all of these things. We may not let down our God. Now the story is actually unfolding. David is now fleeing from Absalom. Absalom is out to kill his own father, just like Lucifer is out to kill to kill and destroy Jesus. And he finally succeeds. But at what a price. He loses everything because he underestimated God. But in this story, in this typology, we read in 2 Samuel 16 from verse 5 onwards, And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out of man of the family of the house of Saul. So someone from the opposing party whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and he cursed, still as he came. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right side and on his left. So here's this Shimei guy. He's cursing David and throwing stones at David and throwing stones at David's colleagues. And David tolerates it. Once your reputation has been destroyed by an Absalom, it gives license to men out there to make their own judgment, start throwing stones, not only at the equivalent of David, but at all of his friends as well. So be careful when we listen to rumors, one-sided stories. Be very careful that we have the full picture. And then, thus said Shimei, when he cursed, come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. David becomes a son of the devil. This is incredible how bad your reputation can fall when someone destroys it or tries to destroy it. The Lord has returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul and in whose stead thou reignest and the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son, and behold, thou art taken in thy mischief because thou art a bloody man. And then Abishai the son of Zariah, and said unto the king, this guy gets annoyed. He's one of the friends of David. He gets incredibly annoyed. He said, why should this dead dog curse my, curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. <laughs> he wants to take matters into his own hands. Well, that can happen too. I sometimes feel like this man, also take a sword and go and lop off the head of that wicked man. But, you know, David has a better way. And the king said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? Let him curse. And it sometimes seems as, as if God doesn't intervene. He does. But God is long-suffering. He allows us to make up our minds, to come to better thoughts, to come to repentance. And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth out of my bowels, seeketh my life. 
How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has bidden him. Don't worry about it. Don't pick up your weapons. Leave the battle to the Lord. If David had been unrighteously accused, leave the battle to the Lord. Spirit of Prophecy says the Lord did not forsake David. This chapter in his experience went under the cruelest wrong and insult. He shows himself to be humble, unselfish, generous, submissive, is one of the noblest in his whole experience. This is the way to treat people that do these things. Never was the ruler of Israel more truly great in the sight of heaven than at this hour of his deepest outward humiliation. Will there come an end to this modus operandi which the devil has? Yes, there will. There will come retribution. And the third little lamb was about to be sacrificed. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under thick boughs when there was finally the conflict of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. So the crown of glory becomes his downfall. Eventually, he will, it will hang you and pierce your heart, as Joab pierced his. Joab and the whole army of Israel had been under strict instruction not to harm Absalom. But Joab couldn't resist. Here was his target. Here was the enemy of David. He was hanging by his hair that he was so proud of. And Joab killed him. 2 Samuel 18.33 says, And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber of the gate and wept. And as he went thus, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the same cry that Jesus gives for Satan. Jesus also wept over Satan, like David wept over Absalom. And Joab is offended. This is your enemy. But he's not just an enemy, he's, he's his son. And Jesus created Lucifer. He created him in all that beauty, and the beauty went to his head. And sin arose in him because of all of this magnificence that he beheld when he looked upon himself. And then the story gets worse. The same character of self-exaltation we find in Absalom's brother, Adoniah. This is the brother of Absalom. He had numerous wives, both from the same mother. And Adoniah knew that God had put Solomon on the throne, and he felt, no, he was next in line. He was just a tad less handsome then was Absalom, and the story unfolds, and it's exactly the same because the modus operandi is always the same. Self wants to be exalted. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 1.15, Then Adoniah, the son of Haggad, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. He does exactly the same that Absalom did. But he just gets a little bit cleverer. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, why hast thou done so? Again, David doesn't rebuke his son. And he also was a very goodly man. And his mother bare him after Absalom. And now look what he does. And he conferred with Joab. 
Joab had just killed his brother. So Joab probably had a bit of a tinge of conscience, right? Because David rebuked him and David was weeping, but he was angry with David because David felt so much pity. We cannot understand the heart of God, why he would allow this to happen if we do not understand the character of God. So he conferred with Joab and with Abiatar, the priest. So he gets a little bit more clever. He doesn't only get a counselor, he brings in the religious party, the high priest. And now Joab, who all those years was so faithful in fighting the battles of the Lord, just imagine that, becomes part of a conspiracy. And they follow Adoniah. You know, this Judas theme runs throughout the Bible. And we can expect to experience it in every single one of our lives to some extent at least. We must have established an unyielding en enmity between our souls and our foe. But we must open our hearts to the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Judas wanted to force the hand of Jesus to announce himself as Messiah. Not because he loved Jesus so much, but because he wanted the position of power as the first minister in the new kingdom. And Jesus irritated him by washing feet. And Joab was irritated with David because David had such mercy and sorrowed so for someone who was actually mean to him. And so we'll have this Judas theme right throughout our lives. We have to be very, very careful lest we become puffed up at any level, whether it is a physical level, whether it is a spiritual level, whether it is a normal life environment level. Some people get puffed up because they think they're better than others because they eat absolutely right. You've never met them, eh? Some people believe they're better than others because of their understanding of a particular doctrine on salvation or perfectionism or what other, whatever. Jesus conquered Satan in the fast of the wilderness and when he came to him as an angel of light offering the dominions of the world in exchange for his worship, he made sacrifices that will never be required of man as man can never attain to his exalted character. That's an amazing statement. We have so many people who think, oh, I'm great, I'm sinless. We can never say I am sinless until this vile body has been changed unto his glorious body. We have to be dependent upon God. Isaiah said when he saw the glory of God, he says, woe is me, I am undone. This was the prophet of the Lord. Now the retribution is to me a fascinating thing. David permitted all of these things. And then comes the next king. And this is Solomon. He is the next king. His brother had just tried, or his half-brother had just tried to exalt himself to be king. But Solomon is crowned as king. And Solomon is the king of wisdom. And here comes now the retributive action, which is actually what God is doing in Solomon. How this matter will end. It's absolutely an amazing story. So when David abdicated in favor of Solomon, the great type of the king of wisdom started to mete out the justice that did not occur in the time of David. So who were the conspirators? It was the high priest, it was his half-brother Abiatar, and it was Joab, the general of the armies of David. And what is the end of all of this justice? 
Well, in 1 Kings 1 verse 49, we read that Adoniah is not executed. Solomon gives him a chance. And he puts him under a time of probation. Joab runs to the altar and he clings to the horns of the altar in the temple. That was a sign of give me mercy. And uh, Solomon says bring him out. And Joab clings to the altar and Solomon gives the command execute him. So Joab dies. This is a rather sad story. Here is a general that fought his whole life for the armies of God and he's lost by a decision at the end. We can make wrong choices at the last moment. The high priest also runs in and clings to the altar. <laughs> Amazing. And Solomon says, remove him from the altar. And he allows himself to be removed so he's not killed, but he's removed from the priesthood. Joab dies. Shimei, the one who threw the stones and cursed David, he's placed under house arrest. And he is told, if you ever depart from your city under any circumstances whatsoever, you will die. And he stays under house arrest for a long, long time. And then there's a business transaction that requires his attention. And the money is very important to him. And he leaves his city. And he's caught in the act. And he's executed. And then the brother who wanted to be king asks for the lady that kept David warm in his old age. And it is his demise. He is executed. You see, justice lingers long and may seem to be deferred, but it will come. God will judge righteously. We must just be patient. Isaiah 61 verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And then we have the story that they will be strong trees. God will restore. We do not have to pick up the sword and fight back. But we have to beware of the technique and the way in which the devil works. Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. God permits evil to expose itself. And if we interfere in that process, we are short-circuiting the justice of God because there are lessons to be learned. People are given opportunities to repent. People are given opportunities to see another side of the story. We must be like David. Don't put Shimei to death. Leave it to God. Shimei died in the end. He was put to death. But David didn't do it. God saw to it that it would happen. He had an opportunity. He had time to think about it, but he didn't. And so we must leave these things to God and we must be constantly aware of how the devil will try to destroy the truth, to destroy reputations, how he works behind the scenes. And we should not listen to stories 
we should make sure that we understand both sides of a story and leave the consequences to God. See how it works out. And eventually, justice will come. May the Lord help us to have this mindset. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are in a war where our personal walk with you will be attacked and where our family will be attacked and where our church will be attacked. And the world will see a one-sided story of what happens and how they should judge according to the information that they have. But you, God, know all sides of a story. And you will vindicate those that stand for truth and righteousness. And I pray that when that time comes soon, that you will vindicate your people on this earth, you will vindicate your church, and you will take those that have been faithful to you into the heavenly courts where injustice and sin will not rise a second time. Thank you for this promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi YouTube, I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.